Okay, uh, again, before we get started, uh, I just want to say you can tell by the title screen you're not going to want your, your little ones in here today. Um, take them down to junior church. Second thing I want to say before we get started is this. Again, you can tell by the title screen that the, the primary message is kind of specific, but, but here's what I want to say to you. Open up your heart today. Maybe you don't struggle with this topic, but I want to say that if this is not a struggle for you, maybe it is. It might be for someone you know. Or if you allow him to, let the Holy Spirit guide you this morning between the lines throughout the message. Allow him to replace the primary topic and let you hear what you need to hear this morning. That's how the Holy Spirit works. He moves through this room and through our hearts during the message if you allow him to. All right, so let's jump in. John chapter 4. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, why did Jewish people not like to associate with Samaritans? Well, the history went way back, but the short story is that people from Israel didn't consider people from Samaria to be true Jews. Over the years, they had kind of intermarried with the Gentiles, and Samaritans had also kind of de developed their own version of the Jewish faith. They cut out certain books of the Bible, and they developed their own place for, for people to go and worship so that they didn't have to go to the temple in Jerusalem. So Israelites looked at Samaritans with contempt. They couldn't stand them. In fact, the, the devout Jews would usually refuse to even travel through Samaria. They, they would take a huge detour so that they wouldn't have to pass through it because they would feel dirty for just even being there. It's, kind of like going into a Waffle House. And I'm not hating on Waffle House. I, I really am not. I love Waffle House. Anytime I get it, can get Catherine to let me go, I go. But with that being said, you walk out of there feeling kind of gross and just a little bit greasy and nasty, you know. And, and in a spiritual sense, that's how Israelites would feel if they passed through Samaria, like they needed to just go take a shower or something. But Jesus took a different approach. He walked right into Samaria, so, so he comes up to this public well, and it says it was the sixth hour. So that means it was about 12 o'clock noon. Ever been to the Middle East? Me neither. All right, but, but it can be brutally hot, especially at midday. How do I know this? I Googled it. And, and I'm from Florida, so that's kind of similar weather. It can be in the, in the mid to upper 90s or Ohio this past week, right? So it's easy to miss this, but the normal time for women to come and get water would be early in the morning before it got so hot. So what does that tell us about this woman who comes to the well at noon, in the heat of the day, when none of the other women are there? Clearly, she's avoiding people. So Jesus is resting by the well, and here comes this woman, and he says to her, will you give me a drink? And this woman is absolutely blown away by this request. She says, you're, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan for one thing. You're not supposed to have anything to do with me. But not only that, everybody knows I'm a Samaritan woman and everybody knows that men aren't supposed to talk to women in public. Jesus cared about people more than he cared about social customs and traditions. And this isn't the main point, but don't, don't you love how Jesus does that? He ignores all the social class and prejudice. When Jesus gets a hold of someone's heart, those social distinctions, they stop mattering. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, 
to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said, what you have just said, is quite true. Now, try to put yourself in this woman's shoes. First of all, she's stunned that Jesus knows these personal details about her life, right? I mean, he, this is not a fellow Samaritan who might know about her reputation in the community. This is a Jewish traveler from out of town, and yet he knows her relational history intimately. How could he know that? But there's something else going on here. And I think this is an intelligent woman because I think she was beginning to see that there was more to this whole water discussion. Like it's not really about water. They're not really talking about water here. And I want to give you three phrases to summarize what happened to this woman. Here's the first one. She saw her emptiness. Here's what she realized. Day after day, she would come to this well and draw water. And it quenched her thirst for that day. But the next day, she, she was thirsty again, so she had to come back. And then again the next day, and then the next day, right? It never satisfied her for long. And then in the same way, she had been going to the well of romance and the well of lust over and over again. And probably the first time she got married, she thought, well, this is the love of my life, and he's going to fill my heart, and he's going to fill my soul, and I'll never be lonely again. But then something went wrong with that marriage, and it ended. And it was bitterly disappointing, and maybe she wondered if she would ever love again. But then she met someone else, and, and then it happened again, and then it happened again and again. And each time, she probably thought, well, okay, now I'm older and a little wiser. I know so much more now. I know what to look for in a relationship, but they kept failing. And after the fifth one, it seems like she just gave up on the institution of marriage altogether. Maybe she thought, you know, this whole marriage thing, it really just ruins the romance and the sex. So she, she's now just living with the sixth guy. Do you see the connection with the water and the well? I think she's beginning to see it. What she had to do over and over again with water, she's been doing over and over again with relationships and sex. She just keeps going back to the well over and over again, but it never really does what she's hoping it's going to do. And I'm telling you, if this is not a perfect metaphor for the society that we live in today, I don't know what is. Can you show us the cross, the necklace? Oh, I have oh you have a tattoo. Yeah, I have a tattoo, and I have the cross on my neck. Well, I'm curious, like, do you think God would approve of you doing only yes. things in form? Yes, yes. God loves me, yes, 1,000%. That's how, wait, God approves of you doing OnlyFans and porn? God loves me, no matter what I do, God will always... No matter what you do? Yes. Do you wear the cross while you're engaging in shooting your porn? I do, actually, I never take it off. I've actually never taken it off in like the past, I don't know, like five Get years. Get the rocks, Abdul. Get the rocks. Get the rocks. Does Jesus say, if you love me, keep my commandments? So which commandment says not to act in porn? I can address that. The purpose of pornography is to create lust. Lust is one of the seven deadly sins. Lusting is equivalent to adultery. Uh, going around the table, what's everybody's body count starting with Madison? <laughs> I don't know. How about that? Give us a range. How about that? A hundred. Over a hundred? I don't know. But you think it's around a hundred? Probably. Over a hundred? Under. Okay. Give or take. What about you? I never counted. It's probably about like 30 to 50 range. I have no idea. Liar. I can't say. Okay. Sure. What about <laughs> you? Liar. I have no idea. I would say 15 males, like 80 females. 80 females, okay. And then. Okay. I don't know either. Definitely in the hundreds. In the thank hundreds? you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you. Let's be honest you. here, guys. I'm being honest. For I, real. I won't answer yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Saw that coming, okay. A zero. <laughs> zero? Zero. I would say about five or six. Okay. <laughs> Your body count over 30? No comment. I'm a man of God. Madison? No comment. Wait, say it. Come She's on. not open. Madison, you've already revealed it. You revealed it. I don't really know. Do I want to get into this right now? Just for a second. No, I, I, Go. I, I, I what is it? Yeah. Now we're having a come to Jesus. What, what? What is it? Eight. Eight? Are you disappointed in your daughter? Eight. It's going to get some bells. Let's start now. There's 
I mean, it's always been true, but I think it's just really, really true now. Do you guys remember that book that came out a few years before COVID? Uh, I'm, I'm sure most guys missed it, but most of the ladies in here are probably aware of what this book is. They made a couple of movies about it too. According to The Guardian, it's one of the top 100 best-selling books of all time. It goes like this. Number one is The Da Vinci Code. Number two is Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows. Number three is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Number four is Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Number five is Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey, in case you haven't heard of it, it's actually a trilogy of books and it's been labeled as mommy porn. It sold more than 40 million copies within the first few months of its release. 40 million, where the trilogy overall has sold over 150 million copies worldwide now. Shannon Etheridge is an author who wrote an article about this book, and I think she is spot on. She said this, I think the real force behind this Fifty Shades phenomenon is that our society is clamoring for closeness. However, in the absence of genuine sexual intimacy, we settle for sexual intensity. Erotica, pornography, an office romance, or an extramarital affair, or whatever strokes the ego and provides the sexual high we crave. The more things change, the more they stay the same, huh? Yeah. The woman at the well is beginning to see her emptiness. Can you see her emptiness? And of course, the porn industry is so much bigger and so much darker than Fifty Shades. And more and more, people are starting to realize and write about the neurological effects. In other words, when you view porn, how it physically changes your brain. There was an article in uh, Salon, the online magazine, and the name of the article was, Did Porn Warp Me Forever? And it's a first-person account of how this author started using porn even before adolescence. And he found that over the years, he constantly had to keep going back and finding kinkier and kinkier porn to keep getting that same thrill. See, this is why I told you that your little ones don't belong in here today. Middle and high school, pff, this is nothing new, trust me. But this guy felt this strong sense of, of shame and guilt, but he, but he couldn't understand why. And the pull was so strong, he kept going back for more and more. And after a while, he realized it was starting to affect his relationships with actual women. He couldn't look at them in a normal way after being exposed to all those countless images of pornography. And toward the end of the article, here's what he says. I'm grateful for my generation's embrace of sexual liberation, but this feels more like a cage. Do you see how empty we're becoming? And you might say, well, I never use porn. I wouldn't do that. Okay, well, let's, let's look at it from another angle. Not long ago, a book was published called Hooked, and it, and, it, and it talked about how having multiple sexual partners starts to physically affect your brain. It's written by two physicians, and I want to quote them directly from the book. The individual who goes from sex partner to sex partner is causing his or her brain to mold and gel so that it eventually begins accepting that sexual pattern as normal. The pattern of changing sex partners therefore seems to damage their ability to bond in a committed relationship. Now you can kind of see why those girls on that podcast seem so detached and almost even proud of their body count or their sex partners. It's really kind of gross and it's a shame. Anyway, the book Hooked, it, it, they use a metaphor of a piece of tape. You know, like if I put a piece of duct tape on my arm and I, 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 it would stick really well, right? But if I, if I pull it off, it's going to be extremely painful. It's probably going to take some hair and maybe even a little bit of skin with it. Um, but then if I took it and I tried to put it on my other arm, it would still stick, right? But just not as well. And the more you use that same piece of tape, the less able that tape is to stick onto a new surface. The pattern of changing sex partners seems to damage our ability to bond in a committed relationship. So we keep going back to the well. Whether it's just messing around with or having sex with a boyfriend or a girlfriend outside of marriage or secretly viewing porn sites or sneaking a 
copy of Fifty Shades on your Kindle so that no one else on the beach knows what you're reading, whatever it is. You know, we have this real quick exhilaration, but it wears off very, very quickly. So we keep going back to the well. Do you see how empty we're becoming? The woman just Jesus met at the well was beginning to see the emptiness in her life and how she was using man after man and marriage after marriage to try to fill that hole. But it wasn't working because it never does. Here's the second thing that happened to her. She encountered real love. She says, sir, the woman said, I, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. I think the woman is starting to get a little bit uncomfortable here because she realizes how well Jesus knows her. And so she does something that people do all the time when things start to get a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit too personal. She asks a controversial question. She tries to take the, the, the focus off of herself and change the subject. It's what we do when we start to see our own spiritual need and our own emptiness and we're confronted with Christ as our forgiver and Lord and, and it's time to make a decision. Will I humble myself and put my life in Jesus' hands or not? But instead, we go, well, what about dinosaurs, right? How do they fit into the Bible? We, we run for the nearest rabbit trail. So the woman says, where do you stand on the debate about which location people should worship at? And Jesus responds to the question, but manages to keep the focus on her. Look at this. What woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Do you see what he's saying? She's asking about which physical location people should gather to worship God. And Jesus says, it's not about a location. It's not about a location. It's not about a building. It's not about a temple in Jerusalem or a, a mountain in Samaria. Samaria. God doesn't show preference to people based on what country they're in or what their race is or what their background is. But I don't think this lady's totally convinced yet. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, <laughs> it's impossible for me to explain to you how those words impacted that woman. But I'm telling you that the hair on the back of her neck stood up. Uh, her heart was probably pounding in her throat, and she probably got dizzy and weak because here was a man who knew the details about her emptiness. He seemed to know what he was talking about regarding how to worship and how to connect with God, and he was claiming to be the Savior of the world. And don't miss this part. He broke every social convention, didn't he? He gave up his time. He, he risked his reputation to talk personally with her, a Samaritan who was supposed to be ignored and hated by Jews, a woman who had so destroyed her reputation in her own community that she came to the well in the middle of the hot day so that she could avoid all of the judgmental stares of the other women in the town. The Messiah was talking to her. You know what we all desperately need? We need someone who will know us and love us. And usually, we settle for one or the other, don't we? I mean, you might love me, but it's because you really don't know me, don't know a lot about me. Or you might actually know me, but you're disgusted by what you see, so you just can't seem to bring yourself to love me. And here's a woman who was known by a lot of people in the town, but she's never been loved. And for the first time in her life, someone sees the depths of her heart her, her mistakes, and her past. He knows her like no one else ever has, and he doesn't turn away in disgust. No, he invites her to come and to connect her life with God and become a worshiper, to come and see. You know why Jesus could do that? Why he could both know her and love her at the same time? 
Because a few years after this conversation, Jesus would go to the cross and willingly absorb God's judgment for every sexual sin that that woman ever committed. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, he who had no sin became sin so that she would become the righteousness of God. Or like the song says, he took her sin and her sorrow and made it his very own. Known and loved so that this woman could be clean and pure and infinitely valuable. Some of you are are honest enough to see some of yourself in this woman. Maybe you feel you have no worth because you've given yourself away too many times. Or you feel like a second-class Christian because of a failed marriage or marriage is. Or you're ashamed because you keep getting drawn back, drawn back into porn. Whatever it is, if you can relate to any of that, you need to see how the Holy Spirit is talking to you personally this morning. You need to see how he spilled, how Jesus spilled his blood on the cross to restore you and cleanse you and give you infinite worth. Because when you see that and when you walk in that love, you can, you can stop trying to fill your soul with the garbage that Satan just keeps trying to offer up to you because you'll no longer feel like you need it to fill your soul, to quench your thirst. Why? Because your soul is being satisfied by the presence of God, by the Holy Spirit within you, streams of living water within you. You will have a heart that is filled with Christ, not a heart that's desperate to be thrilled by something dark, This woman had met a lot of men, but never anyone like this. And she was changed. And and so here's the last thing that happened to her. And this is so great. She found her voice. Look at verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her, she left her water jar. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see, a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And this is amazing. Because before this, this woman wasn't confident enough to invite anybody to come and see anything. Because she had such a low view of herself. And, I, and she was pretty sure that everybody else in the town felt the same way about her. But now, suddenly, she had found her voice. And did you notice? The thing she's inviting them to come and see is not herself. She doesn't say, come and see my life. I'm, I'm, see the guy I'm now going to marry that I'm living with. And I'm never going to divorce him. So come and see how my life has changed. What does she say? She says, come and see him. And look what happens. Let's skip down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Yeah. See, when we become confident that Jesus is the real thing because of what he's done in our lives, the only thing that makes sense is to invite people to come and see him for themselves. Because when people see Jesus for who he really is and spend time around him and with his followers, then that's when things happen, supernatural things And don't miss the beauty of this story. A woman who was living in shame and enslavered to her own desires has now been freed to find her voice and be a blessing to everyone around her. It's breathtakingly beautiful. And I want to close us out with this today. The woman in the video that you're about to see was on that same podcast. I can't show you the original video because it just wouldn't be appropriate for church. But trust me, she had those other girls beat by a country mile. All right? I mean, multiple partners, OnlyFans, it was a lot. But as she talked on that podcast, you could tell that maybe for the first time, she could actually hear the things that were coming out of her mouth. And, and I think she, had finally, she could finally see what she had become because somebody had enough love for her to push back a little, to help her see that God loves her. And I think that God spoke to her through that podcast. So I don't follow her on TikTok or anything. I really only kind of follow fishing content creators. Uh, But for this message, I went to her account. 
And I, and I can't imagine what it was, what it would look like before the podcast, knowing that she did OnlyFans and this stuff. But this is what I found. I have a couple things to address. So about four years ago, I started my OnlyFans. So I made what I made, I did what I did, but I wanna share you, share with you guys the truth of it all because I am now giving it all up for Christ. I am now truly a believer. I would never take it back. God radically saved me from this darkness. Do you wanna to go to heaven or do you wanna to go to hell? And my soul, I'm sorry, but it's not worth going to hell for at all. And God loves you so much that he's willing to give you everlasting life. You need to understand that your life is very temporary here on earth. And we all have a mission. And that's to preach the word of God. So to the men and women who are on the explicit sites like OF, and there are many, many more, I want to be the first one to tell you that you are so worth it that you do not have to do this. No one hopefully is forcing you, but you do not have to do this. If someone would have told me how worth it I was, how beautiful I was, how loved I was, I most likely would have never done it. So this is me telling you how beautiful you are and how much God loves you. He made you so beautifully and wonderfully made and we can't even comprehend that. But you are so beautiful. You are so beautiful and you're so special. And this is not what God called you to do. And I'm sorry if this hurts your feelings, but this is not it. The money, the fame, whatever it is, the materialistic items that you get to buy with that money, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting your family. You're hurting your friends. But besides all that, you're hurting God. God did not create you to do this. Yeah, that's a powerful story. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I didn't watch her content prior to that, but um, I can't imagine you know, and, and, and what, a, what a turnaround. I'm telling you, when Jesus gets a hold of someone, when he really gets a hold of someone and you open up your heart to him, he can radically change your life. And God has been changing lives for thousands of years. Would you let him change yours today? If you, would, if you have not given your life to Christ and you're walking on a similar path to some of these girls, and you would like to make that decision today, we can make that happen. You can give your life to Christ. We can baptize you. And you can walk in the light of the Lord. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Dear God, Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you for this place that we have to come and to lift up your name and worship you and hear the message that you want to put on our hearts, Lord. Lord, I pray for all of those who are struggling with walking in darkness, that you would allow us as a church to bring them to the light, that we would be such a bright light that they couldn't help, they couldn't ignore it. Lord, help us to be that church, to help people see and, and bring people to you. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.